Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. All right. I'm glad we have believers singing in here tonight, not performances, aren't you? It's a vast difference between the two. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and verse 11, please. Ephesians 2, 11. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 11. The Word of God says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, that's like in Ephesians 2 when it says, but God. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Father, bless this holy word in thy name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. There's a lot of things about this text that needs to be mentioned, but for certain tonight I want to make one thing very clear. The Apostle Paul could not have made it any clearer that outside of Israel there was no knowledge of God. There might have been a superstitious knowledge of Him, but no true knowledge of Him. This is why the Apostle, when he went to Athens, Greece on Mars Hill, and he saw a stone raised to the unknown God, he said, let me tell you about Him. And so the Gentiles do not know God. They can't find Him. They have no resource. They have no way. They still don't. The Bible said in the book of Romans chapter 9 that God revealed Himself to Israel and gave them the oracles of God. And so therefore the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, that's my God. Amen. Not the God of Abraham alone, nor the God of Abraham and Isaac alone, but the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. That's the God of Israel until they get off into the Kabbalah and get off into a bunch of foolishness. But if they stick with the Tanakh, the Old Testament, that's the same God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what that does is give sanction to Genesis through Malachi that it is the Scripture. And to the two on the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus said, search the Scriptures. Scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life and they are they that testify of me to search the Scriptures. He said, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ first to have suffered, then to enter into His glory? That, of course, was Genesis through Malachi. So it's obvious tonight that Gentiles have no recourse. They have no, they have no way of knowing the truth outside of the Word of God. Your way is not as good as the next man's way who is as good as the next man's way. Relativism will damn you. There's no hope in it. It's condemnation. So, the Scripture says plainly in Ephesians 2 and 11 that you were Gentiles in the flesh. But God showed mercy. In John chapter number 1 and verses 16 and 17, the Scripture makes this statement. John 1, 16 and 17. Of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's important to understand tonight. This is one of the reasons that I am such a strong dispensationalist. And, that's for, and, and that is because if you do not differentiate from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you try to drag the Mosaic Law into grace, like uh, some amillennial or postmillennialists do. For example, Augustine, Augustine, one of the so-called fathers of the church, was certainly a theologian in his own right, no question about that. But he was also very amillennialist. He, had, he said as far as God's concerned, he's finished with Israel, and he wrote his famous City on a Hill. And it teaches that the earth becomes the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven as men build it here on this earth. So what does that do? That means that the burden is upon you to build the kingdom of God, build the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. That led to a lot of problems that I'll talk to in just a few minutes. Augustine was the grandfather of all of that, and many followed in his steps. Some, for example, like John Calvin. So grace, the Bible says, and mercy came 
and truth, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I want you to notice how the two words are linked together so many times. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. The Bible has a way of doing that. Putting two words together. Two words together. Grace and truth. And that's a remarkable thing when you think about it. And when you think about the fact that grace and truth finally met and kissed. And they did at Calvary with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 4 through 8, the scripture says this. Ephesians 2, 4 and 8, 4 through 8. But God who is rich in mercy, do you see this? For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, notice how they're broken down into distinct periods. Ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Apostle Paul was undoubtedly a minister of the grace of God. And one of the reasons he was is because he was the apostle to the Gentiles, calling them into the body of Christ. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 7, verses 7 through 8, the Old Testament is very clear on it. Grace did not change any. It's just the ministration of it changed. But the, 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 the definition of grace is consistent. It changes not. In Deuteronomy, chapter number 7, verses 7 and 8, The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, that's all, because He loved you. And because he would keep the oath which he'd sworn to your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's the grace of God. You see, you didn't earn it. He told them plainly, you didn't even deserve it. But I loved you. He loved them. In Deuteronomy chapter number 9, verses 5 and 6, the scripture continues. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess the land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And that he may perform the word which the Lord sware to thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. With the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 6, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 1, 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. There's so many things that you learn about after you're born again. You begin to learn about all these things that happened to you when you were born again. You didn't have to know all of that when you were born again. You don't have to have a Ph.D. in theology or a Th.D. in theology. No, but you begin to learn them. And that's part of the grace of growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you have to learn them here. You have to experience them. Your relationship and walk with the Lord is experiential, not intellectual. Your relationship and walk with the Lord is experiential, not intellectual. Your mind can never comprehend Him. You'll never walk with God in your intellect. You've got to walk with Him in the heart. That's not easy. You must pay a price to do that. But He'll give you grace to do it. He'll give you grace to do it. So the Bible is very clear on that. In uh, the grace and mercy that He offers to sinners mitigates. Ezra chapter number 9 verse number 13 Mitigate means that uh, to lessen, to ease. In plain words, if they get ready to sentence someone in a court of law, they, have, they may have mitigating circumstances. The lawyer will bring forth mitigating circumstances when they have the hearing for sentencing, for the sentencing hearing, to mitigate. In other words, to lessen the punishment or the severity of it. And notice how the Lord does by grace in Ezra chapter number 9, verse number 13. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trans trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities, deserve and hath given us such deliverance as this, 
should we again break thy commandments? This, of course, is the minister of God. That's what Ezra was, reminding them that they'd come back from 70 years of captivity. And even at that, it wasn't near as bad as what they should have experienced. Wouldn't we all tonight be honest with God and say He hasn't dealt with us nearly as severe as we should have been dealt with with our sin? The law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Why well, should have been in hell a long time ago? Deserved it, worked for it, lived for it, breathed it, day in and day out. But by the grace of God, I stand before you here tonight and open up the Bible. The grace of God is the only thing that I can give credit to. Not my goodness or my ability or deserving. There's nothing in me to deserve this. He's a gracious God. He wants to show mercy. He desires to show mercy. It takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. From the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them. That's what he cried from the cross. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He was ministering grace. For God did forgive them. In the book of Acts, chapter number 2, the apostle Peter said, I know how that through ignorance you did it. That means that God did show grace and mercy. One more time. The law came by Moses. The law is cold holiness written in stone. You don't want that. The law is the righteousness of God declared in words written in stone. You don't want any part of that. You want mercy. Because there is no man that ever has lived or ever will live that could ever approach God on the basis of righteousness or holiness. Just one. Just one. The Lord Jesus Christ. So it hasn't been as bad on us as it should have been. Micah chapter number 7 and verse number 18. The Old Testament says this, Micah 7, 18, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. That's God. Don't ever try to build your relationship with the Lord on how you feel. Because you'd be surprised at how many of your feelings are what we call uh, ingrained, but you're not even consciously aware of where they came from. But you feel something. You feel a certain way. Well, I'm just too low down and sorry. God won't accept me. That's not what the Bible says. I've done something God won't forgive. That's not what the Bible says. You see what I mean? He's a merciful, long-suffering. He will forgive sins. In the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 13, just to remind you one more time, Luke 18, verse 13. The Scripture says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Will God hear the prayer of a sinner? Yes. Well, of course he will. If he doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner, a sinner can't get saved. Who's the sinner pray to? He prays to the Lord. Do you know who said that God heareth not sinners? Do you know who said that? You know who said that? Pharisees said that. Do you know what they said to the man that was born blind? Do you know what they said to him? He was born blind and his, his disciples said, does this man sin or his parents that he was born like this? They said that out of ignorance. But do you know what the Pharisees said to the man born blind when he came to them? He said, you instruct us and you're altogether born in sin. That's what they said to him. And you have the audacity to instruct us, the high and holy and mighty and righteous Pharisee. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said about the righteousness of a Pharisee and the righteousness of the law? He said, according to the righteousness of the law, Philippians chapter number 3, according to the righteousness of the law, blameless. Yet he was a murderer. You see what I mean? How many of you know the story of Hagar in the Old Testament? Hagar is an Egyptian. All right. The Apostle Paul uses her in Galatians 3 and, and, and makes an allegory of what happened. Well, now an allegory is fine. In the Bible, plainly calls it an allegory. It takes an, it takes an historical event and uses it to teach a spiritual lesson. That's fine. But the problem is, don't try to allegorize the Bible except when the Bible allegorizes the Bible. There's nothing wrong with an allegory as long as it's scriptural. All right. 
Hagar was a real person who lived. She was an Egyptian. She just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Say, so what do you mean? Well, she was a slave girl. And Abraham was the master and Sarah was the master's wife. And God had promised them a promised seed. Genesis 3.15, Sarah said to herself, maybe this one. But the, what happened was that over a period of time, God didn't answer the prayer about a child being born to Sarah. And so they got in a hurry and they said, well, I'll tell you what. We'll just let Hagar, you go into Hagar, Abraham. You go into her and we'll raise up seed. Now, back in those days when a woman did something like that, and uh, this was apparently a, 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 a pretty well accepted custom, from everything that I've read from it, she, Hagar, sat in the very lap of Sarah when she bore the child. So Sarah was there, present, and physically was part of the birth of Ishmael. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that Ishmael is not the promise of God. Isaac was. So what happened? Well, Ishmael was 13 years old. And Isaac is born, comes into the home, and the Bible says that they were mocking. And Sarah got, she was enraged, incensed. And because of that, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman, get rid of her, send her on her way. And he didn't want to do that because he loved Ishmael. That was his son. Uh, but he did. He followed her instruction, did, cast her out. Hagar went out into the field. She went into the desert and took her son with her. And the Bible says that they were ready to die. Now here's this Egyptian bondwoman, handmaid, who's born a child to Abraham. Not of her own choosing, but she was just a, she was a victim of circumstances. She's out in the field. She's out in the desert. She's about to die. And do you know what happened? The angel of the Lord showed up. He gave her water, spared her life, said he was going to bless her. And he did. And that, of course, is where your Arab comes from. The problem between the Arab and the Jew is not political. It's not even geographical. The problem between the Arab and the Jew is a family feud. They've both got the same daddy. Different mamas. That's the problem. It's a family feud. It's been raging and it'll continue to rage till the second advent. That's grace. That's grace. He took care of her. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that, but he did. Do you know why? Because it's his nature. You see, God can act for a lot of different reasons, but God is always who he is. God does a lot of different things according to a dispensation, to a person, to a thing, to a purpose. But God is always who He is. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That's important, folks. He is who He is. To, Abra to Moses, He said, I am that I am. Forever everlasting from eternal past into the eternal future. He changes not. He's that almighty, eternal, self-sufficient one, needing nothing with an unbelievable amount to give. But he can only give to those who can receive because he sends the sun down upon the just and the unjust. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. When the rain falls on the unjust, they curse the day because the sun's not shining. If the sun comes down on the unjust, he curses the day because his crops don't grow. He didn't get enough rain. But on the just, he takes every day alike and he lifts his head to heaven and thanks the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Amen. You people have heard about John Calvin, haven't you? And I'm sure you've heard of the doctrine which essentially uh, uh, defines uh, one of the basic tenets of Calvinism is TULIP. It's an acronym for total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, predestination. These are the five pillars of Calvinism. What is Calvinism? Calvinism, to boil it down to the, sim to the simple element, is that God has foreordained, predestined certain people to be saved, foreordained, predestined certain to be condemned, and damnation eternity without God. 
a lot of Reformed churches, a lot of the mainstream Protestant churches believe in Calvinism. Augustine, Augustine is the granddaddy that John Calvin got his doctrine from. The teaching of the city on a hill, the teaching of the idea that God's done with the Jew once and for all forever, that it's up to the church to build the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven on this earth to turn the earth into a holy paradise of God. That'll get you in trouble. This is why you've got to be very careful about what you believe about premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennialism. There's a lot of movements in the country today that are pushing the same doctrine of Augustine when they're pushing the city on a hill, the idea that, uh, that, uh, that they can turn the earth into the kingdom of God, into the paradise of God. The only time this earth will ever change is when the one that made it comes back to it. But John Calvin was responsible for a man being burned at the stake. Let that settle in. His name was Michael Servetus. He was a Spaniard. In his day, he was probably one of the most brilliant men alive. In the 1500s, this man had figured out that the human heart pumped blood in and out, and as it passed through the phases of the chambers of the heart, it either had a depleted oxygen supply or it was loaded with oxygen. He figured that out. And that's what happens in the heart, the pulmonary movement of the heart. For the heart, pumps the blood into the lungs, the lungs oxygenate the blood, circulate it through the body, it comes back to the heart, it needs to be oxygenated again. How did he figure that out in the 1500s? But he did. He was a smart man. But he was burned at the stake for two reasons, books that he wrote, and here's what they were. One of the things that he said was that he did not believe in baptizing babies. Amen. He believed that a person should be a believer to be baptized. And the other thing that got him in trouble with John Calvin was that he did not believe in this classic doctrine of the Trinity. What's that? That is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. Well, there's a lot of argument that goes one way or the other. You can get off into a lot of theological phrases and term, term, terminology and argument about this. But the bottom line is the way he saw it was that the Son was the Logos. He was the Word of God before He was incarnate in flesh. Once He was incarnate in flesh, He was the very fullness of the Godhead standing before men, that He was God of very God. But because He did not believe that there were three distinct persons in the Godhead, they burned Him at a stake. And there are those people today who argue both ways, either way about it. That's something you need, you need to spend a little bit of time in prayer and reading your Bible and doing some real thinking about it. Here's the problem both ways. You go too far one way and you have the Jesus only group. One is Pentecostalism. And their teaching is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are simply uh, offices of the one where they just, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's just kind of a, a, a mystical way of saying that God the Son is all the God there is, then God the Father is simply the Son acting in this capacity by the power of the Spirit. And then there are those who are strict Trinitarians who go to the extreme in the other direction, which was pushed by the Roman Catholic Church, that you've got three individual distinct people, persons, that make up the Godhead. The problem is you've got to be very careful with that or you're going to have three gods. There's just one God. Just one God. It is the mystery of the Godhead and it is the mystery of godliness. Is the Lord Jesus Christ God? Absolutely. Is God the Father God? Absolutely. Is God the Holy Ghost God? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I certainly do, but I believe there's just one God. I'll leave that to the time when He manifests Himself to us. We see Him for who He is. And don't ever let some human mind, because human beings are so arrogant, they are so arrogant, they got to figure it out so they can impress somebody with their knowledge. And you're not going to figure God out, not until you see Him. We'll see Him as He is. I no, yeah. 
I firmly believe that there will be a manifestation of God the Father. You'll know it. There will be a manifestation of God the Son. You'll know it. And there will be a manifestation of God the Holy Ghost and you'll know it. But it probably won't be anything like you've got figured in your mind. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I'll tell you right now, I believe Jesus Christ is God Almighty. I certainly do. I certainly do. There's no question in my mind about it. But he burned him at a stake. They burned him at the stake. And John Calvin said, uh, they say of him, he was forced to push the condemnation of Servetus with all the means at his command. At his trial, Servetus was condemned on two counts, spreading and preaching non-Trinitarianism and paleo baptism. In other words, anti-infant baptism. And these are the two things that I just mentioned to you. Here's a quotation of Calvin. I hope that sentence of death will at least be passed on him, but I desire that the severity of the punishment be mitigated. In plain words, Calvin was saying, he needs to die, but don't burn him at the stake. Cut his head off. So let death be quick. Like Henry VIII was good at that. You could take a few lessons from him. Uh, he sure had some heads cut, and some of them were his own wives. <clears throat> cut their head off. So Calvin tried to, uh, he tried to, even though he said the man deserved death. Now, why would you burn a man at the stake because he didn't agree with you theologically? Is that the way you preach the grace of God? No. Or if you're building the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, then you've got a different situation entirely. Yes, sir, it is. Now, do you, know, do you understand why that a professor at University of Tennessee or, or uh, Southern California or Harvard or somewhere like that who has studied the religious wars and the dogfight they've had over uh, points of theology, he rejects all of it. You know why he does? Because Catholics have burned people at the stake, and so have Protestants. Both of them. And if you ever hear a preacher get up and blast the Catholics and blast the Catholics and blast the Catholics, but never say anything about the Protestants, he's got an agenda. Are you following me now? Yes. Because he is purposely either ignorant or he's purposely hiding the whole truth. And the whole truth is that when the Puritans came into this country, they took the land away from the American Indian. They even enslaved them. That's the truth. Not all Puritans are like that. For example, Roger Williams was a Puritan. But Roger Williams had a different take on things. He said to the magistrate, why do you think it's right for you to take the land away from the Indian and not pay him for it? That's what Roger Williams said. He also said, why do you put a man in jail because he doesn't observe the Sabbath day? Shouldn't he have a right to observe whichever day he wants to? Well, according to the book of Romans, he should. Do you know what they did to Roger Williams when he said that? They banished him from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Remember Massachusetts Bay? Do you remember when they came in there in 1620? How the Indians got them through that first winter? If it had to have been the sons of Shem who came in there and fed them, showed them how to plant corn and put a fish in the hill where they planted the corn, they introduced them to maize is what it is. They introduced them to it. And these people lived because of these Savage pagan Indians that God used to get them through that winter. They buried half of their number. Half of them died. And they came to this country. Of course, we're talking about pilgrims and we're talking about Puritans and they're not the same, but we're talking generally in the sense that they came to this country to get away from religious persecution, yet they turned around and did the same thing to the others. Why? Let me tell you something, folks. Your eschatology, your view of what God is supposed to be doing on this earth is going to affect your theology. It's going to affect the way you treat people. It's going to have a profound effect upon what you do to them. And that's what happened. Well, Roger Williams founded Rhode Island. That's one of our states. And the capital of Rhode Island is Providence. And where do you think he got that name from? 
by the providential hand of God, God protected Roger Williams, who was cast out, banished in the winter time, who should have died in the field. God protected him, saved him through the winter by using the American Indian. That's right. He used the American Indian. Now, I know I'm not politically correct, but that's, I've been around longer than political correctness. I lived in this world for decades before they ever started changing the way everybody said everything. So what am I supposed to do? Look back on all those people that lived before me or lived back in those, since, back in those decades when I grew up and uh, that, that taught me and everything and say, you're just a bunch of fools. Everything's supposed to change now. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No, sir. You have a waiter and a waitress. <laughs> and that's what we called them. Is there something wrong with a waiter or a waitress? Did you know if I wrote a little essay and sent it to you and said the waiter brought such and such to the table, you'd know exactly, you'd know immediately there was a man. If I wrote a thing to you and said the, ser the server brought such and such to the table, you would know what I was talking about. You would know if it's a man or a woman, right? You see how clear they've cleared things up? <laughs> they don't get clearer, folks. Yeah. So, Roger Williams had a different take on things. Do you know why? It's because Roger Williams understood the grace of God and mercy. Grace and mercy. Did you know the Bible says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now, how many people do you think you're going to win to the Lord when you burn a man at the stake? Did you know that right now there's a movement afoot to, uh, to raise Michael Servetus back up to a, a position of, uh, of, uh, of honor and reverence? And one of the reasons is because they know he was that, that what Calvin was, was, was complicit with in his death, that what Calvin did was a horrible thing. And every time I see the Institutes of the Christian Religion, that's the series that Calvin wrote, and I've got his commentaries. Every time I look at them, I can't think of anything but Michael Servetus. That's who I think of immediately, Michael Servetus. I think about a Spaniard that he had burned at the stake because he didn't agree with him on a theology that, that, uh, that he couldn't explain himself. That's a sad thing. How do you deal with each other now? What's your attitude toward each other when you deal with issues like this? What should your attitude be? Think about it for a minute. I know people who go from, from one, they, they go to a Baptist and they're a Methodist and they're a Presbyterian and they're a Pentecostal and they're this, they're that, they're this, they're that. I don't know what they are. They're looking for a perfect church. And I've heard the old Southern way of saying it, the, if, you try, if you think you found a perfect church, the minute you walk in, yeah. it's imperfect. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because nobody's perfect. Which is, of course, a American cliche. Nobody's perfect. Well, we all know that, don't we? We know that. We know the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men, yes. teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? One of our biggest problems is, the, is how we perceive ourselves. There's so much arrogance. Some people have so much of it, it just, it, they, it just exudes. It just, it's an aura around them, you know? It's, it's, it's a spirit. You're in the presence of the Great One. The problem with someone like that is that they've never been in the presence of the Great One. Once you are ever in the real presence of that real eternal being, He'll humble you. So that's the good thing about the way God deals with us. He gives us an opportunity. He said to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and exalt you in due time. That you can choose, you can choose consciously with your own volition, your own will. You can choose to say, Lord God, I'm a little smart aleck puffed up thing. I've got so much of myself. I'm so full of me. All I, I think everybody's thinking about me when I walk in the building. You know, I'm it, and I don't know whatever happened before I showed up, and I don't know what's going to happen when I'm gone, but I'm it. 
and I'm the greatest thing that ever lived, and you've done more with me, and I don't know what the church is going to do without me, and I'm the greatest, I'm it. But they won't say it that way, but that's what they think. And yet they think they can have a relationship with the Lord. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. He resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Right? Let me say it this way, and I'll come to a close tonight. Grace you have to receive. That's God's message to you. That's a, that's a gift to you. Grace br brings so many things, but you've got to be able to receive it. Your pride, your stubborn rebellion will refuse grace. The unsaved man, when the grace of God appears to him and tries to humble him and convict him and show him he's lost, no, 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 no. If he's a religious man, he'll throw his religion up immediately and say, no, no, I'm a good man. I'm as good as the rest of them. I was baptized as an infant. I've been confirmed. I, I give my tithes. I belong to some social organizations and benevolence committees. I do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. What happens to a man like that when he dies? That's right. There's no hope for him. Now, Christian, that's not a derisive term. They were first called Christians at Antioch, and it, was, and it was a term of derision. That's what the world called us. I wear it as a badge of honor. Amen. The word means Christ-like. Before they called them Christians, the Bible said they were of that way. In the book of Acts, over again, over and over again, of that way, that way, that way. The reason they said that, it, that way, of course, it's a generic term. It's indistinct. And the reason they, the, the world called them of that way is because they didn't know anything about that way. <laughs> they had no way to define it. They didn't know anything about it. They still don't. But Christian means Christ-like. God help me. Am I like Christ? Am I like Him? Do you think the Lord Jesus Christ would have burned Michael Servetus at the stake? I went to Salem, Massachusetts one time, my first and last time, never go again. That was the deadest place I've ever been in my life. It had spirits crawling everywhere. It was. And they also hung some believers up there in Salem, Massachusetts, real believers from the testimony of some crazed teenage girls whose testimony didn't even agree with each other. And so from that you get the Salem Witch Trials, which becomes a, 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 a springboard for the news media. Anytime they're, like uh, when, uh, when that senator back in the 50s, uh, what was his name, McCarthy, McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy, when he was trying to root out communism out of the film industry and out of the government and, and out of the military, Joseph McCarthy went after it, tooth and toenail. You know what they said? He's on a witch hunt. And that, of course, referred back to Salem, Massachusetts. We don't have to hunt witches. You don't have to hunt them. You don't have to hunt anything. We're not here to hunt anybody. We're not here to hunt sinners down and burn them. We're not here to do that. We're not here to destroy kingdoms. We're not here to tear down governments. Whoever blew up those kids up there, killed that little eight-year-old boy up there in Boston, Massachusetts, that's a murderer. Now, what do you think his motivation was? I don't know what his motivation is, but I guarantee you one thing. Christ didn't tell him to do that. He's a murderer. He or him or them or whoever they are, they're murderers, indiscriminate murderers. They didn't have any idea who'd get blown up when they, when, when they detonated their bombs. They didn't know just whoever happened to be there. Horrible stuff. What kind of religion uh, perpetrates that? So what are we here to do, folks? We're here to do what Christ did. We're here to be who he was. We're here for him to live his life in us again. We're here to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're here to see the miracles of the hand of God performed by the same one who did it before. He said, many works have I done. You're going to do the same and greater. The reason we don't see the power of God manifested is because we're doing it and we merchandise it. There's some of these guys on television, every time I see them, the only thing they talk about, sow a seed, sow a seed, sow a seed. How many people in the world watch these people and say to themselves, if that's all it's about, is that what it's about? We got 66 books of the Bible appeared to nearly 2,000 years to write all that, and it's all about sowing seed, sowing seed, sowing seed. That's sad, man. That's sad. That's sad. It's not about sowing seed. It's about knowing God. That's what it's about. It's not about sowing seed. 
When they start getting on that television set, we want you to sow some seed to that man's ministry, I may start listening to them. <laughs> they always want you to sow the seed into their ministry. Send it to them. I'm going to send them a thing one time and say, I took your, I took your, I took your encouragement and I sowed some seed. I gave $10,000 to this ministry over here. <laughs> Let's rejoice together. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Garbage. Flim flam. <laughs> Fly by night. Religious hucksters. A strong talk, preacher. That's all they are. That's all they are. Hey, many, many men. I know this. I know for me to be like the one who died on the cross, to be in any sense at all like him. To bear that image for Christ to be formed in me, there's an awful lot of me that's got to die. And the truth of the matter is, I can't kill me. Just like you can't crucify yourself. But I can let the work of the Holy Spirit do the job. Amen. And if you walk in the light as He is in the light, He'll show you. And He'll command the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Father, in Jesus' name. I thank you for what you've given me and what you've said. I trust that I gave forth what you put in my heart, and it's true. It bears witness to the Word of God. I pray for every soul that heard it or will hear it. I pray for them. May it have the ring of truth. May it have the ring of truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. In Jesus' name I pray, and amen. All right, I'm done tonight. Finished. <laughs>